good shape. Okay. We're rolling on YouTube. Okay, we're good. All right. So we just wanted to have this meeting to really give everyone a chance to talk sort of internally about what Paul's put in front of us so far. Uh, you know, brainstorm a little bit questions that we want to ask him or areas that we want to uh, further investigate. Uh, so I'm going to talk email, I think, um, that went out on April 7th. I had it up here and then I had to close it. So let me see if I can find it again. Oh, with the plans. Does everybody have that email? Yes. And I can um, share that out on the screen if that would be easier for everybody to talk about. If you'd like me to do that, I can do that now. That would be great because I, I otherwise I cannot do it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's, let's share that then, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. All right. Is everybody looking at the plans? Yes. 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 I do have the volume all the way up on my end, but Harmeet, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Is there any other way to, to turn up the volume a little bit? Is that any better? Just barely. <laughs> Yeah, mine's all the way up. Mine's all the way up. All right, how about now? Any better? It's better. Thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Let's see how well it works. Uh, okay, uh, so I had a couple of questions that I wanted to sort of put in front of the, the group here and give everyone else a, a similar chance. Um, as far as uh, our criteria, I guess, for starting to select between various options. And I think it's important to remember that these are these are very rough sketches, right, that Paul has put together, right? These are not concrete concepts that we're going to be voting on uh, by any means, right? It's really just to start the conversation. And so the intent would be for us to find things we like or don't like about various pieces of the options, right? And then I can go back to Paul and say, hey, we think this is valuable. Hey, we don't think this is valuable what would a design look like that incorporates all of the elements that we want? Uh, so to that end, right, to try to get to um, that, that collection of things that we, that we like, that we think are important. Um, certainly the cost, I think, is, is a big piece of this. I mean, Mich Michelle, you mentioned that last time. Um, yeah. We don't have any cost numbers yet, so we'll, I'll have to, I guess, think about how we come up with some cost estimates. Sorry, was there a comment? Okay, uh, and then I guess everything that cost, uh, uh, Jeff, the other idea that struck me during the last conversation with Paul was um, the, the dot exercise that we did, right, with the, the um, patron group, right? Um, how, do we, how do we sort of figure out which of these options or which of the features in the options are really hitting on the uh, um, concepts that were identified as high priority? Right, and I think that's that's exactly um, that's that's exactly it. The interpretation, interpretation. Of the data from the public, and this expression as a plan, right? And so, so I think Paul and Lisa have have given us their thoughts, at least their early thoughts about what that is. And I think the committee's work is probably now to talk about your interpretation of that and. Um, and see, you know, which of the pieces of this or, or what of this meets what your interpretation of the data is from the public. So do you do you have the data from Paul handy? We probably don't want uh, right, right during this discussion. Um, yep. Give me a sec. Uh, we'll try to to bring that up. Let me just let me mute myself. Uh, okay. Go find that email. I'll be back. Uh, so just while Jeff's doing that, any other thoughts from other, other how we how we could go about you know identifying what we really like what we don't like what the criteria should be? Well, I noticed from the dot exercise that um, the greatest percent I think it was like fifty six percent wanted to expand collections, and while he has on the um, 
on the drawings, like if you start at the, the drawing, like even number one, um, he's, he's written down that he expands the collection, but when you compare it to the drawing of how the library is right now, it doesn't look to me like it's any larger. Um, and I realize it's just a drawing, but um, I, I don't know, every time I look at all three sketches, I just don't see that he's actually expanded the space for fiction and nonfiction books. Okay, and I, th I had a, I think a similar question the last time we talked to Paul, and so I think one of the updates he's gonna make for us as they formalize some of these, um, uh, some of these concepts, right, and have, have more access to their office and the tools they have, is to add the square footage and the linear shelf lengths that, that are being added with each one of these concepts. Uh, right. So yeah, I, th I think that's, um, that'll definitely be one of the items we want to focus on when, once we get right. there. Right, that, that would be very helpful. Other thoughts? Just for clarity, are you all now looking at the public space discussion desk responses? That yes. Yes. This is, I mean, not to this particular point, but what I recall from the last meeting with Paul said the Borthwick property is not very conducive to an expansion because of the shape of the parcel. Does, did anybody else heard that? I, I think what I heard was that, and and I, you know, I, I I'm willing to be wrong, but, uh, but that the shape was different. I think than a lot of people, the shape of the property was longer and skinnier than I think a lot of people, and certainly even they thought it was when they got in there to look at it. It's not that it can't be used for an expansion. It's just that um, you know I think they'll have to uh, with, if they don't want to disturb if we didn't want to disturb uh, infrastructure, including the exit. Um, driveway, the sidewalks, and then the underground infrastructure that's, uh, you know, there's some plumbing, uh, wastewater infrastructure that's there as well, um, water supply, that sort of thing. Then it, it, it limits the size of what you can do on that property. Yeah, so he was, I felt he was leading us towards looking at an expansion on the other side, primarily. This is the impression I got. I don't know if other people felt the same way. You can always ask him, to expand on that. Or maybe I misunderstood him. Or Yeah, I guess I think it's the impression that he was he was advocating to expand on the other side. I think just that he was highlighting the, the limitation in terms of what we can do with the space. Uh, but but it's a it's a good question. A, a related point is is just that in the um I think it's the third um, model or the third set, uh, sketch, um, you know, I, I still have a hard time quite visualizing that expansion because, uh, you know, I raised this question with Paul at the last board meeting, the, the way it is um, uh, drawn in the sketch doesn't line up with the, the, the Borthwick property. Um, and, you know, Paul addressed that a little bit, that. That it, but I, I, I'm still having a hard time uh, th that that's clearly the biggest expansion easterly right of all of the uh, to be found in any of the sketches but I still have a hard time seeing how it fits onto that space uh, Brian you're referring to the what's number three here on the chart or? that's uh, no the third sketch um, uh, so it'll be on page seven I think That one, I should have said six, though it's also on seven. Yeah, it makes it look like the property lines up perfectly with the building to do that expansion, but it's really not at that same angle. Right, exactly. So I'm having a hard time really picturing what in reality this would, this would look like. So I think that's a related point to what Robert's raising, that there do seem to be real constraints on the uh, east side of the property, um, and that and that perhaps Paul is trying to compensate for that yeah, with this Paul westward expansion. Any thoughts in particular about the the Borthwick property 
sort of concepts and whether large meeting rooms um, make sense for how to use that space. It, it, that, that was what I had originally um, thought, but that wasn't, you know, based on any analysis of, of other options. It was just the first thing that came to mind. Yeah, for me, um, the piece that I found interesting was that, I mean, I guess in my head too, I had thought, oh, there's a space you could have, uh, uh, you know, we're looking for a large meeting space, trying to shoehorn that somehow into the existing footprint doesn't really work. You've got about the biggest space that can be shoehorned in there now. Um, you know, and isn't that, isn't that space work well for that purpose? Um, I was intrigued by the concept of that, we'll call the westward expansion now, I kind of, uh, I kind of like that. And um, the idea that the large meeting room could go in that direction too, without impacting the space of the green, you know, I, I, again, spatially, it didn't fit in my head that there was uh, quite that much room that way. Um, while leaving a while leaving an intact green, you know, certainly we had had have had a past consultant say, "Oh, there should be a you know an annex building out in the green, take the whole green, and that would you know that would be the increased space of the library." Um, I was intrigued by the fact that there was space out in that direction um, for a large meeting room. In my head, I guess I assumed it was um, it was to the Borthwick property side. Um, if I can chime chime in uh, just in in reference to something you brought up, Michelle, I think. I, I agree with you that uh, most of these models don't seem to expand the collection space that much, but now looking at this particular sketch, this one does by the relocation of the children's library. Um, and so that children's library now becomes uh, all this extra space for more uh, media shelving and fiction shelving. So I guess I, I agree with Michelle's point in, about the other two sketches. And then the question I would have is with this sketch, which does expand collection space, but at the at at the cost, and maybe that's not the term I want to use, of this relocation of the children's library. I'm curious what people think about that idea of relocating the children's library there. We've already brought up some concerns about it, but I wonder what everyone else's thought is. Um, well, first, before we get to the children's library, I actually did look at, at this sketch. And, and when you look at at least how he's drawn the, the shelving, um, because he's put the media in with the fiction and, and added more tables, um, it, it actually, it really didn't look to me like it was extra space for materials. It kind of looks like the same space, he's just moved it into a different area. And then, like I said, added um, media and more tables and a reading room to it. Um, so yeah, so my concern really was in, in all three sketches, it, it didn't look to me as if he was expanding the space for, for um, the collection. Um, but as far as the, the children's library, when I first saw the sketch, I thought, oh, wow, that's so great. The children's library is right near the green space. Um, and uh, having been a, a parent of young children that use the library quite a lot, I just thought that that was a, a great idea. But then someone brought up in the meeting um, how having the children's space so near the exit might be an issue. Um, and, and that immediately brought me back thinking that, well, maybe that's not the best location for it. Do you recall what the concern was having it near the exit? Uh, the kidnapping of children. <laughs> <laughs> I think that or, might have been me who brought that up. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah. And, and it wasn't so much the um, to me that there was because there's a there's an emergency exit out of the existing children's library as well. It, my concern had been more about the way the children's desk is designed here because Paul had talked a lot about sort of sight lines and this kind of, you know, the sort of built in networks of, of, of natural surveillance um, uh, that this model um, uh, incorporates but then you have this children's desk that has this huge blind spot over by, by this exit which uh which i thought um was some something to be uh talked about um but i didn't i didn't necessarily have a concern about safety in terms of having the chil children's safety library children. there but i do i do wonder if you know i can see how patrons who don't like hearing noisy children while they're trying to read would love to see the children's library relocated you know, way out west. But I also have, I, 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 
I stumble over it a little bit, this idea of, of sort of separating out the children's library so much from the rest of the library. Um, I guess one thing that occurs to me is, you know, the children's library, you're, you're developing lifelong readers, you're getting children as at a very young age to come into the library and see that as a place where they're comfortable and happy to be. But if this is the only library, you know, for them, this is what the library is, this space over here. Um, I, I wonder if you're really creating kind of lifelong users of the library as a whole. I don't know if that uh, that objection really makes any sense, but it's it's something that's on my mind. I no, I thought so. I agree with you. I think the kids need to walk through the building and see all the other things that are there. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that that sentiment. Yeah, and then I think I think you lose the the benefit of having um, the children pull adults into the library, right? When it's when it's this separate, right? You almost want the children's library at the absolute back, right, of the rest of the library proper, so that as their their guardians and parents are bringing them through, they are then interacting with the library and seeing materials, right, and getting that time in, right? Because I, I think, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the children's area is a, it's a high volume location, so to speak, right, and it's, it's a draw. It's a high volume location, it's a draw, it's the milk, right? So where, in a grocery store, where's the milk? Back left corner, right? Yeah. Because you go past everything else to get there. And, um, you know, absolutely, when we talk about the children's library, um, bringing parents into the library is when we tend to regain uh, adults after, uh, you know, uh, uh, young adults frequently, you head off to college and you're not using a public library so much, then um, as they, uh, as those folks begin to have children, they come back to the library and that then forms the core of our business. Yeah, I agree. So looking at the plan that's on the screen right now, um, here's my some of my concerns. Um, having it so close to the door, we do have runners. So when you're talking about security, if they're automatic doors, um, it's this much closer for the kids to be able to escape to get out towards the parking lot. So right now we have that issue already where kids usually get to the, the sliding doors as you walk into the library proper. Um, while there's a program room attached to the children's library. Um, the majority of the time, we're probably gonna be using large meeting room as well, especially, you know, who knows, you know, 10 years from now, what type of situation do we, you know, what's going on today compared to 10 years from now, are we still gonna need, need a larger meeting room for a little bit more distancing? Um, so you're gonna have all these kids chopping from the meeting room to the children's place or the children's place to the meeting room, vice versa. So they're, you know, where they want children to be quiet. They're going to be walking through the whole library now to get from one end to the other. Um, he still has the children's reading garden um, off of the teen space. So that's no longer a children's garden if it's not by the children's library. So if we're going to be inviting children to use that, once again, now they're going through the whole library to get to a whole nother location. So to me, it kind of there's a lot of a lot of big separations between the children's area and some spaces that would be used by them. But I do like it being attached so closely to the green. Um, but we only use the green for maybe 10% of our programming throughout a year. Um, we're only looking at usually kind of from like June to September, early, maybe early October, um, but that's weather dependent. So. That's just my thoughts on the children's area section. And even if um, the green space is not is only used for 10% of the pro library programming, it is used by families just to have the kids run out some extra energy. I mean, definitely, I think the green space gets used beyond just the library programs. Yeah, yeah, you always see people out there, um, the kids are just running or sometimes families will do little picnics out there. Um, so I do like it attached right to that, but I think the other layouts, maybe don't fully make sense, you know, like the children's garden, just, it's just no longer a children's garden, just call it an outdoor seating space, you know, and do right. we locate a children's garden over by the green, you know, um, I think there's some good concepts here, but some of it to me just seems a little bit broken, you know, off from each other. Would it almost make more sense to replace the children's library in the, in the sketch with the quiet reading area? 
I mean, if the, if the goal is to sort of separate the noisy children's area from the quiet reading area, are you better off putting the quiet reading area at a little bit of a distance from the rest of the library proper and then keep the children's library closer? I don't think he has a designated quiet reading area on this sketch. He's got some, you know, tables off in the corners, but not, not an actual designated area for it. But if you took, um, I think, you know, if you took the, the, the individual study quieter areas that we currently have in the periodicals, the periodicals area that we had a request uh, one of the things that was requested by the public was that we expand that, have more of that space available for people. That certainly is low density use that could be um, outside, that would be more amenable to being further afield from the center of the library. Okay. The other thing I noticed about this sketch is he didn't include a conference room anywhere. Where are we gonna meet? <laughs> well, he's got a medium meeting room off of the small meeting room. Like you'll see the children's library, then children's program. Yeah, in that area. So one other thing that I was just thinking of um, is that the two information service desk, you know, is um, staffed by the public services department. And we would have to look at staffing issues if we kind of looked at this plan, um, especially for Friday nights, because we only have one librarian on each desk. So when they go to take their breaks, one librarian is actually watching the whole library and they can't do that with this type of a plan. So we would definitely have to talk about, um, you know, staff schedules and that sort of thing. Yeah. And just to be clear on the other sketches, he does include a conference room along with a separate media meeting room. Um, so the third sketch really does, it does leave that out. I, and I think some of that is this second floor uh, gets addressed a little bit on the second floor. This space is currently the mezzanine space. Um, this, get, this got kicked around as being either um, either open as like a like a, a, a high clear story vestibule open space at that part of the library, or if you wanted a second floor in here, you would have. Uh, classroom and seminar space up there. So, so we're definitely not negative on total meeting space. We're, we're, we're into the positive on that, but um, you know, which of those spaces were declared as the board? It does bring up another question I wanted to put in front of the team and that is um, second floor utilization, right? So depending on how far we go with the expansion, right? We've got the, the current second floor space, right? With all the poles and yep. then potentially a lot more second floor space if the Borthwick expansion ends up being a, a two floor solution. Um, what are we comfortable putting on a second floor and what are we not comfortable putting on a second floor? So, if you, so for my opinion, I, I uh, second floor, the concept of a second floor that has any routine space on it seems like a bad idea to me. Um, there are certainly libraries in the world that have multiple floors uh, is, is, is a workable thing. But uh, back to Chris's point about staffing, uh, minimum staffing, uh, I think adding a second floor means that you've got to have a person that's routinely on a second floor with that space if you've got public up there. You know, I, I think that's, you know, in the second floor sketch, let's just take this as a concept this you've got the classroom and the seminar space up here i think that could be workable if it was sort of a bookable space it wasn't a place that you had immediate access to and had to be let into but um it's definitely uh, a nook and a corner i think it, just my opinion unless you were really going to get a real second floor which uh you know i think was proposed back in 2000 um and the community was not interested in um, you know, until you get where you're going to have a big chunk of your staff routinely being up there like on the second floor, it feels like second floor spaces ought to be more, more likely to be the staff spaces that would then leave more space on the first floor. Yeah, I think putting the offices that are on that first floor over by like the maker space and stuff, moving those all up to the second floor 
Um, and then opening up those, the office space rooms that he has on there, maybe a little bit better use of the space. Um, Cause I agree with Jeff, you know, then there, there's definitely security issues um, and safety issues. If we allow the public to go upstairs and there's not enough staffing, or maybe there is one or two staff members up there or one staff member, it, that's now a safety concern, you know, um, once you allow the public up there, they, you know, they have the thought that the whole space is all there. So. Yeah. And Jeff, you were breaking up a little bit when you were, when you were talking. So just to make sure I, I captured the gist of it, the thought is um, second floors, avoid collection spaces right up there, avoid anything that's sort of generally accessible to the public. So staff offices would be preferential or possibly spaces that you reserve? That I, Yes, I think you, you caught it exactly. I wouldn't want to see, uh, just from my, from my perspective, I would not want to see um, casual and occasional public spaces, you know, booked public spaces like, uh, like a classroom, more of a formal space, um, but staff are up there because offices are up there too. Um, I think that could work out, but the, like, the idea of, taking the nonfiction section and putting it up on the mezzanine now, just leaves too many nooks and crannies and too little staff um, routinely up there to observe what's going on. I've worked in libraries that had lots of nooks and crannies. It's not a good idea. <laughs> Another, um, the, the, you guys are, are raising so many uh, interesting issues here that uh, many of which I hadn't even considered. Another thing we have to remember about this particular sketch too is uh, that this involves a, a major uh, engineering engineering work, right? Because what is it that we need to move from the main entrance area for this one to be feasible? It's the transformer. Yeah. The electrical transformer that's in that sort of the round brick structure as you're coming in on the library. It's on your left as you walk in the front door of the library. So in terms of expense, <clears throat> um, I imagine uh, that's going to be a huge part of the expense of this particular conception. Definitely uh, wouldn't. Be. Yeah, I think it would be expensive. I like uh, the sketch number one. I like the westward expansion the best where they leave the transformer circle there and then use what we were talking about as maybe the children's room as the large meeting room that could open out to the, um, to the green. I feel like that gets us closest, closer entrance, covered entrance to the parking lot and then a bigger meeting space that then still connects out to kind of the concert area with shifting a bunch of stuff in that area. <laughs> Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. In this scenario, we're not using the Vortec property, right? Uh, that's well, why I would, I, would, I would caution you from saying us in this particular drawing, yeah, the, the, the Vortec drawing is just sort of that uh, up in the top right, you see, you know, link to future edition. But I think for the purposes of this discussion, you know, we can say, What's the use of that? If there was expansion in that area towards the plaza green, what would be a good use of that? What would be a, a use that we could all see that would be reasonably, would be safe, would be um, useful, would be meeting the, the public has been asking. And so I, I kind of agree with Kevin, I kind of, I agree with Kevin that um, to expand in that direction, to have something that far afield, a large meeting room makes sense out there to me too. The, the meeting room can already be a little separated from, from where we are as it is, so. We had talked at one point about uh, when, when discussing possible uses for the Borthwick property, um, added green space. And I suppose there's a, a, a stronger argument for that when we're taking away from green space to the west for this meeting room, that then we're sort of compensating by creating some sort of usable green space in the in the Borthwick property, it, it would it would seem more more purposive and intentional, right? You mean to demolish the property and use it as green space? 
in the con yes in the context of this design um there'd be a good rationale for doing so Jeff, do you know like approximately how far like the large meeting room that's here, like how far would that go out into our current green space? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think that's a question that if we were to say we were interested in that, that's exactly we would. That's a question for Paul. We would say, hey, how much, you know, how much space could we get out there? What would we be losing? And then, uh, you know, come back and take a peek at that. Let me roll up to this sketch again. Uh, yeah. when, when they're talking about the expansion, much of the, in this area, much of the space that they're taking is taken up by Brick Plaza right now. So um, anything yeah. through the Brick Plaza, I'm a huge fan of. Um, so it's really not that much, maybe in this space a little bit, that, that's, that's that entrance to the green, the hills are here and here those hills that run along. So it's not much of the green space. And there's a, there's a lot of, this is the largest area that he's got marked off there other than taking every available inch on the Borthwick property. That's the largest area of potential expansion. To that end, uh, would it make sense for us to to provide Paul with say a rough estimate or a rough measurement of how much of that green space we'd be comfortable okay. giving up. I mean, it, it'll be a judgment call, right? But if if, if uh, Jeff or Kevin or someone essentially goes and stands in the green space and says, yeah, this feels like a minimum amount of space that we want to retain, right? When you're looking at the green space and the stage, essentially everything behind you is what we're prepared to sacrifice, right? For the expansion in that direction. I think when you when you look at this uh, one that's up on the screen right now and like not where the kind of arched outer edge is, mm -hmm. but that's fine. Like when we have concerts and stuff on the green, people are rarely pushing back past kind of where the garden in front of handicap and where the um, the other garden up to the right, like where they kind of pinch off the green area. You never really see people expanded out past that for any of the concerts or anything. So I think we'd really be saving enough green space over there even if we push 10 or 15, 20 feet west of where the plaza line is now. Okay. The people right. that I see that are at the concerts in those spaces are the people who are unable to walk on the grass and so have to keep either a walker or a wheelchair on the plaza itself to look basically down this way to look at the concerts. We have some people that gather here to watch the concerts and I think that could be addressed somehow in this space actually bringing those folks closer um making it more accessible okay so that, that's that's actually a, a good potential adder i guess for the for design criteria would be to to provide a um a handicap accessible place or mobility limited place to right. watch concerts yeah okay when we had a, a design done to, to do a, a band shell in this area one of the things that was added was a walkway that came up, kind of went in the front and then met up this way uh, with a little pad here that would have allowed exactly sort of more discreetly a place for people to, to get to while allowing also the bands to um, move their equipment on rollers to the stage. So I think there's some merit to some of those concepts. And now that we have this sketch up. I did have another question about, um, it seemed like a lot of the, well, it didn't seem like, um, most of the public responses said that parking lot improvements were important. In fact, they were only second to um, energy efficiency. Uh, and parking lot improvements, I thought, meant expanding the parking lot. But he hasn't addressed that uh, on any sketch. Um, and I know we have talked about entry accessibility, but actually when you look at the public responses, that was pretty low on the list of priorities. Um, but parking lot improvements, perhaps that does include accessibility. I don't, I don't know what each public person you know, was, was thinking when they, when they voted on that. But, um, but I do know that 
having enough parking space has been an issue many times. And is anyone else concerned about creating more parking space? I think it would definitely be a good idea. Is yeah. it surprising Paul didn't address that at all? Or were we never going to address parking? I think it's the limitation of the property kind of like, uh, it seems like within our parking area, we've gotten all the parking we can out of that. So without kind of taking another section for adding more, I don't really know that you can add a ton more. I think they said if we, we reworked it, we could get maybe four more spots in that area if they were angled differently, but you're not going to gain like a whole nother parking lot five out of anything. All right. Uh, if, um, you, if you use the Borthwick property as green space, you could expand the parking lot into the current green space. <laughs> but uh, but I don't know how much it costs for demolition. That sounds expensive to me. Wasn't there, um, when we were looking into uh, the plaza uh, remediation at first, didn't we learn that the uh, accessible parking spots were that we had too many of them? It, it's not that we had too many of the accessible parking spots, but these, uh, the access spots in between, would be a few by, um, you don't have to go handicap spot, accessibility spot, handicap spot, accessibility spot. You can, you can have handicap spot, um, Handicap spot, handicap spot, accessibility spot, handicap spot, handicap spot, accessibility spot. Two, two, um, two handicap spots can access one accessibility area. So it's just with a reworking, a restriping of this a little bit, the, the handicap spots that are on this side could be brought over to here. And then we would gain effectively those spots for this side. So that's where we're, we're saying you get a couple, you know, you get like three, three spots there. Um, nice close spot so it's it's worth doing just through restriping but then you have to address the slope issue here as well i see so that is that that was what you were referring to kevin about the restriping gaining us in spots yeah and the only question i have about that is that seems like a then a something that we should explore but i the one thing i just wonder is so that would put us in compliance or keep us in compliance would it be the best service to um, patrons who require these spots to only have those um, loading and unloading spaces on the driver's side, right? Or which I, I assume is what, what happens when you com compress in this way. I, I think that's right because you're you're that's a perfect that's a perfect point. There's there's what does what is required by by the code and then what's convenient and the best use, right? So maybe you'd have to look at how how often are those spaces being used um, using the, the ramp accessible spaces on that, but it would require um, someone to turn the car around and back in if their ramp accessibility had to be on the left side or right side of the car in particular, right? Um, and I think that would be difficult for some of the buses that come in. I do worry, though, if we're talking about um, expanding the library and expanding programs and having very large meeting rooms in a teeny tiny parking space. <laughs> um, if we're expanding so much and yet leaving the parking area exactly the same, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to make rational sense to me. It's going to be a challenge. And Michelle, yeah. I think you're exactly right. And, and I'll mention that a few times. Is, oh, we might have to talk about the timing of programs and maybe the spaces, you know, at times with town hall, um, you know, town hall, uh, the courthouse uses our parking lot at their busy times. It would then be, um, we would have to, pro we would have to have our programs at times that maybe town hall was less busy so that um, we could expand over into their lot, which happens naturally anyway, but it would be, have to be a little bit more. Yeah. If I could say something else about the parking situation, I totally share Michelle. I think Michelle's thinking here is is right on that if we're expanding the library, it's we're just going to have increased parking issues. But then the cynic in me also says that if we add, let's say we add twenty more spots, that will just be twenty more spots used on Tuesday night by people going to the courts, right? That I mean, that it won't we won't solve the problem. We'll you know it we'll just have a di different way of counting the problem, I guess. Mm -hmm.
Jeff, have we had that conversation with the with the town hall folks about explicitly allowing us to to use their space? Well, it, it's a municipal lot, so so I have talked with multiple uh, town supervisors through the years, and yes, it's an absolutely allowable use. Um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the times that we want to have a large program, um, what will happen is. Um, some of our busiest days are take the Del Mar Progress Club is having one of their large meetings and we do a story time, not even necessarily a huge story time, but we have some sort of program at the same time. It is those points that the library uh, is the busiest. So, um, you know, when we do an evening on the green, parking can be difficult. That tends not to be when it's pinched the most. It's during, when we do a daytime big, big program or there's a big meeting and then uh, all the folks that are working at town hall, of course, are parked at town hall parking lot, so they can work there. They're just there, you know. There's not a lot of spaces, uh, and that's why you know Fortnite happens Tuesday night. It certainly makes it uh, difficult for some of the staff people that are returning and want to start working at five. But after that, even though it's busy on Tuesday night, the whole the whole parking complex, imagine town hall plus our parking lot, is one thing, is not as as um, as densely populated as if we do a big program and a meeting during the day. That is when it's very intense because then there are no, essentially no spots next door um, at the town hall. So that's the, the evenings I'm almost less worried about. Okay, gotcha. Other, other thoughts or questions that came up going over these signs? Well, I know Mary had mentioned at the board meeting, she was worried about drainage issues so I think we should just double check with Paul that, that he has addressed those um, in his sketches. I don't remember him speaking specifically to that issue. So I don't know if he's considered it or not. Yeah, I think he mentioned like, oh, there's drainage and uh, what, you know, what, what's the available space, what's the available green space for drainage, but right, nowhere, none of these plans are to the point yet where they would consider square footage of you know, percolation rates and, and any of that. So we're just, we are, we're miles from that yet, but I think it's a good thing to keep in mind as we, as we, you know, begin to move forward. You don't want to put hardscape over every possible spot. Uh, we're not allowed to put hardscape over every possible spot for um, where rain can perk down through. And we're lucky right. to get on sand, so that's good, but we know that this area of Delaware uh, and our property has had, uh, you know, continual water issues over the years, so. Okay, so we talked about the, the parking space, uh, the second floor, uh, meeting room locations, children's library. Uh, those were the big things on my list. Uh, Catherine, you've been really quiet so far. Any thoughts? Not to call you out, but I kind of no, do. that that's fine. Um, if you go back to the to number one, um, the right there, uh, where where we didn't move the transformer, the circ desk is still nestled right in the middle of the library. And I think one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is how do we get the circ desk closer to the main entrance so that. Not only is it the first stop for people who um, maybe have mobility issues or just need to come in and um, get a hold, but also how it can be the last stop when people um, are on their way out and we can you know, do the final, oh, have a nice day kind of greeting. So uh, a couple of the plans, I think two um, moves the circ desk, this one exactly. So now we have the circ desk and the ref desk kind of, um, uh, in the same sight lines and the entrance, it's easier to get to the CERC desk. You have a library of things area. This one just um, centralizes um, access to the CERC desk. Is, is this um, one where the transformer has to be moved? I yeah. think it's still there um, and I, you know, I mean, it's, it's moved, right, right. It, it's, it's been moved. Um, and I, you know, if you could get this concept 
in a way that doesn't um, have to destroy all that mechanical work. That's fine. You know, and the other thing I like is you could even have a combined circ and ref desk here. I know the help desk is over by the study rooms, but there's there's a this this seems to draw some functions together a little bit better and um, allow a little quicker approach to the circ desk. And you know, if we can keep that concept, I, I'm for that. I think if we could work that concept in with somehow not moving that transformer, kind of like combining yeah. two in a way that gets the inside desks how you were, you're saying, but then have the entrance way be more like one would, would work well. And like when I was talking with Lisa the other day, she threw out a rough number of like, say $300,000 for moving the transformer, which, but then she's like, oh, but that's nothing in a big project. But I mean, that's a lot of money in a project, especially when it means, you know, everything down the line has to get moved power wise after that too. All right. I think like if we could keep the transformer and have that entrance in like your, but then kind of the circ desk and help desk set up the way you have it in the number two, like if one could blend with two, I think that would be nice. A comment on this number two sketch. Um, so Paul has, uh, linked the children's uh, programming to the children's library here by adding an access door into the children's library, which is, you know, it's something, but to me, not not the most desirable way to try to link those together. I think most people would, would love to see the children's programming space be adjacent to the children's library. Um, so I wonder if that studio area, yeah, that's being circled now by Jeff, I think maybe that would be a story time space and, and we sort of rethink how how things have been apportioned here or signed. That's why I like the way that number one moves the story time room down into that corner of the of the children's area. Expanding out towards Delaware for that. All right. And another question um, about this: do do people think that one and two provide enough of a of an improvement to this teen space? A lot of people uh, expressed a desire. A lot of patrons for um, a robust teen space. Well, you know, I don't know what robust means, but does this seem robust enough? I questioned that too, that the teen space was so small in, um, in all of the sketches, um, just because we did surprisingly, it was surprising to me anyhow, that we heard that so much from the public that they wanted a more robust teen space. Um, so I agree with you, the, the space in the sketch looks small. Well, I also don't see shelving. So I'm not sure if it's just like a meeting space for them and a space for them to hang out. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, I thought the collection was right outside the room. Yeah. So even that collection, I mean, if there's two shelves, that's definitely not enough. So it's hard to tell on this screen, it's so tiny. <laughs> right, let's see, that's my problem too, even with the fiction section, he's got a help desk in there. Um, oh, you took it off, on um, sketch two. So he's got, yeah, help desk, all the computers and extra tables. It looks like there's four shelves for the fiction books. So, yeah, it's hard, it's really hard to tell from these sketches. Yeah, I do like the teen space off of the children's area because there's times that there's kids that, um, you know, they're kind of that tween age and they're um, younger, but they're at a higher reading level. And to be able to have that access right there to be able to go over and help pull materials for them is just more helpful. Um, and I think it's also, you know, parents like to know kind of where their kids are, you know, we're not talking older teens, you know, parents don't care where they go in the library, but if you're talking somebody in a fifth, sixth grade, um, you know, sometimes those parents still want to keep their eyes on them, but maybe they have another younger child. So I like the fact that they're all still kind of close together. I second everything Chris just said. <laughs> She's right. She's definitely right. Uh, I think the the thing that we have to keep in mind for a project, the certainly a project the size of uh, scope uh, as sketched out in this, you know first concept, and um, and still in the second concept, there are major compromises to what the public has asked for 
that are going to have to be made. It's just, you know, the size of the building is the size of the building. And I think the work of the committee would be take what you heard, what you think, you know, the data that we have available to us, the comments that we got and say, okay, well, there's really 10 things that the public have asked us for. Choose two. And that's going to be the theme of the expansion, right? Uh, you know, if you're doing um, a, a something, if the, if the 10 year plan of the library is something along the lines, I put up sketch one here. So we have, and we don't even have sketch zero, which is the leave the floor space exactly as it is and just try to reconfigure inside that space for maximum efficiency, right? But we're taking, you know, some modest expansions here. This is, if this is our 10 year plan, even in that 10 year plan, major, major compromises. And, I'm, and this isn't an argument against it. It's just, I think, a realization that we're absolutely not getting everything that everybody wants. There will be things that just have to drop off the, the, the back of the bus. And that, um, that's going to be the work. That's, the, that's going to be the work of, of this committee is to try to decide what, prioritize those, you know, what's your top one, what's your top two. Yeah, Jeff, that's a great point. I had uh, sort of two thoughts um, about how to start working that. Um, one was, um, if you wouldn't mind, I just want to spend some time, uh, Jeff, with you and I running through the results of the surveys, right, and maybe take a first pass at trying to align uh, what we think the concrete deliverable could be or concrete outcome could be for some of the highest rated item highest rated items yep right and then come back and put that in front of the larger committee and the and the board right and say hey this is what the what the public feedback was here's what we think they meant right and what it would take to deliver that right and then i think as a larger group we can start to do that rack and stack of out of the 10 things they said they wanted which are the two or three we really think we can deliver and on Paul has done some of that work for us. Um, he did put all the information together and identified uh, the major priorities in that um, that board update, Jeff, that that you had emailed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he has a whole page where he's just highlighted the, the greatest priority from the Y meeting, the public discussion, and the staff discussions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think we just we just take this and, and start to uh, start to brainstorm a little bit what, um, yeah, I guess what the definition of success is, for lack of a better term, right? For for the highest rated items, right? And then uh, Jeff, the other um, item I wanted to bring up real quick before we run out of time is thinking about um, library usage patterns, right? In ten years from now, right? I know a lot of people at a lot of libraries around the world. Right and around the country, spend um, spend time thinking about this, uh, and I, I, not to put you on the spot here, right? But um, maybe for our next discussion or even before that, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on how we think those uses patterns are going to change and what we should be anticipating. Yes, uh, so I'll just take a very uh, a very thin uh, veneer example of that exact concept. It's an important thing that we discuss. What we heard from the public was they wanted to increase collection space. And we had heretofore a dropping physical circulation uh, and uh, increased interest in electronic download. So those two things, what the public has said to us that they're interested in, and then what they are actually doing, do not match up. Hmm. So what that will look like post-COVID, there'll be some new information into that. But that's something I mean, you so yeah, so people say, I want this, but then they don't actually use this that's a hard that's a hard concept to get to how do we marry up without disappointing people you know, we said we were interested in your input but then when we offer some if we are we going to offer a thing that then is five years from now of decreasing interest in use yeah and i think that that's a, a great point my my assumption as far as the feedback we got from, from the general patron group right is that they're mostly thinking about what they'd like to see right now Right. I, I don't think a lot of the feedback we got was specifically how do I how do you think you're going to use the library in 10 years and what do you want the library to look like in 10 years. Right. So, so that's a filter we'll have to apply to say, yes, if I could do this tomorrow for you, I would. But if I do that for you tomorrow, it's going to be obsolete and wasted in 10 years. So maybe we 
don't prioritize doing that right away. Right. And I think we underpin, you know, we hedge against that by underpinning the flexibility of space in everything. And that's where, you know, that um, the, the gorilla in the room are those poles that hold up the second floor of the mezzanine, right? It is in the ultimate of unflexible design. That's the, that's the, the part that sits right next to the dictionary definition of unflexible design. And yeah. at some point, some, some library, some version of us and a board is gonna deal with those poles. And the question is, is now, is now our time to begin to discuss to deal with that or is that something we defer for the future? Yeah. Okay, I know we're just about out of time. Um, last, last thoughts, comments? Go ahead, Michelle. What's me? <laughs> Oh, that was me. I was just gonna say I I agree with Jeff. I think once the poles are taken care of upstairs, um, it provides a whole bunch of opportunities down the road of how you can reutilize that space for something different. I have I, just go ahead. Go ahead, Michelle. I was just gonna say I thought Jeff had a good point earlier that we do still need to see a sketch from Paul that just reconfigures the current space just to see what it is we could do with what we already have. And one thing that I hadn't really been thinking about until looking at the sketches uh, with all of you today is um, one of the major, uh, a lot of space is allocated to the, to the maker space, I think in all three sections, all three sketches, which right now the maker space is, is part of the studio, right? Oh. in the current library configuration. Yeah, there's, we have some of it's in the studio and some of it's back near my office, yeah. Got it, yeah. like where the 3D printer is and so forth or, or that's considered part of makerspace. Yes. So the only thing that I, I note there, I, I'm, very, I'm very pro having a makerspace, expanded makerspace and, and, and unified or cent, you know, centralized makerspace space. But in terms of um, public support for it being at 8% versus the percentage of space allocated to it in the sketches. I just wonder if that's something to, to rethink. For example, the maker space in the, um, in one of the sketches is considerably bigger than the team space, for example, yeah. which I seems re the inverse of, of the Mommy, feedback we got from the yeah. public. Yep, I think you're right on it. That's Any last uh, comments, concerns? Okay, thank you very much everyone um, for the time and, and for the feedback. Apologies in advance if I was overly directorial in my approach to this. I no. went from one work meeting to another work meeting and it's just hard to get out of that mindset, so. No, you were uh, great. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll Thanks, Armin. Thanks, Armin. Right. Bye, everyone. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>